He Gödel mentioned that he arrived at his result by thinking about the liar paradox. And, and uh, so we, we knew that uh, uh, surely we couldn't have uh, sentences saying of, of themselves that they're false. But uh, he thought, well, what about a sentence that says of itself that is not provable? Hmm. And, um, and this, uh, well, an important part of, of his proof is, is the fact that uh, these sentences uh, uh, about the language of arithmetics can actually be mapped onto sentences of arithmetics itself. And, mm -hmm. and uh, aside from that, they, they can actually refer to themselves. And these are two aspects that um, surely Russell had an envi envisage, especially the possibility to be uh, self-referential, because he would have immediately thought that something was wrong, I suppose, if he had suspected that this was possible. Could you tell us uh, how this was possible. How could you go about um, proving that sentences about arithmetics can be systematically mapped onto sentences uh, of arithmetics? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, look, what Russell's reaction to Gödel's theorem was, I'm not sure, I'm sure he must have talked about it somewhere, but by this time he was losing interest in mathematics anyway. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure... I was, I was reading about, yesterday, but I couldn't find uh, the, uh, the reference that he said something, all oh, right, well then should we believe that uh, 4 is equal to 1.5 or something like that? But I'm not sure whether, I, I couldn't find the, the reference, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is true. Yeah, well, look, I'm sure that some of the Russell aficionados out there in um, uh, the greater world will know what Russell made of it. Um, and probably, you know, if you have a blog page, that write and then tell you, but I can't remember. Um, okay, so set Russell aside. Um, look, there are a number of different proofs of Gödel's theorem. He came up with the first, but we know several more now. Um, Uh, some of these appeared when recursion theory developed in a more systematic form mm, 10, 15 years later in the work of people like Turing and so on. But all the proofs that I know do depend on the fact that you can code things as numbers. So these might be computer programs or these might be proofs and so on. So this coding technique is central to all the proofs that I know. And it was a technique that was um, developed by Gödel. So let's come back to that in a second. There is a clear analogy between Gödel's proof of incompleteness and the liar paradox. So we've talked about the liar paradox before. So the form, this sentence is not true. If it's true, it's not true. If it's not true, it's true. So you have a problem. And in fact, that was used, um, that argument was used by Tarski um, in the late 20s, early 30s, to prove that the concept of truth is not truth for an arithmetic sentence is not definable arithmetic. Essentially, use the lie paradox, right? Um, but what Gödel does is not use the liar paradox, but um, a paradox of provability, which is very, very similar. I mean, I've called it the provability paradox or Gödel's paradox. As you said, uh, it concerns the sentence. Um, it's not the case that this sentence is provable. Okay, so suppose it's provable. Well, then it's true. 
So it's not provable. So it can't be provable by reductio or whatever. Um, and we've just proved this. So it is provable. Okay, that's Gödel's paradox. And clearly his, his proof of incompleteness applies this in some sense. Um, was he trying to prove the inconsistency of arithmetic um, and the incomplete result fell out? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that anyone has commented on this. But this, this argument is certainly driving a bit of the argument. Now, um, it turns out that given that you can represent this kind of argument about provability in arithmetic, you might think, well, hey, why doesn't it show that arithmetic is inconsistent? And the answer is that it sort of fails by a head's breadth. Um, we can go into that if you like, uh, why? But there's just one very crucial small step at which you can't push the argument through. Yeah, let's get into that. You want to talk about that now? We haven't talked oh, about well, it. Whenever you think it's um, most... Okay. Um, well, we can deal with that now. So if you, if you take your mind back to this provability argument, probability paradox argument I gave you, uh, it said, okay, so it's the sentence is, this sentence is not provable. Suppose it's provable. Then it's true, so it's not provable. Okay. In fact, you don't need to invoke truth here. All you need to invoke is that if you can prove A, then A. You have to mention truth. So it appeals to this principle that if A is provable, then A. Um, and you cannot establish this in axiomatizations of rhythmic, at least if they're consistent, because then you can push through the argument. So um, there are instances of this principle which cannot be proved in arithmetic. In fact, there was a result established some years later, I'm not sure of the exact date, by Loeb, who showed this. Uh, Suppose you can prove something of the form, if A is provable, then A, then A must already be provable. Of course, it's supposed to hold for everything. Intuitively, it's true for everything. Um, but given a consistent arithmetic, you can only prove the instances for those A that are already provable. So, you know, it's, it's, an, it's another kind of um, way of getting at Gödel's incompleteness theorem, because here are some things which you can't, which are obviously true in the standard model, but which you can't prove. Um, so um, you cannot push through the Gödel paradox argument on pain of inconsistency. All right. So do you want to consider? Do you want to continue with that, or do you want to go back to provability? Uh, well, let's go back to provability. So this is all on the assumption that you can express things like um, the, the apparently a paradoxical sentence as a purely arithmetical sentence. In other words, you've got to phrase it in such a way that you're only talking about numbers. Because provability isn't about numbers, it's about axiom systems. Um, but one of the clever things about Gödel's proof is that he showed how you could express facts about provability and so on simply in terms of numbers. And you do this by coding. And coding's kind of easy when you, you know, sometimes kids play this game. Um, I'm going to write you a coded message, right? But I don't want people to know about it. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to assign A the number one, B the number two, C the number three, and so on. And then I'm going to write my message to you uh, as a sequence of numbers. So instead of... I, don't, I can't do this in my head, but instead of A, B, C, you write one, two, three. Okay, and you know the code and you can decode. 
So if you know the codes and you know how to decode, then uh, you can express the sentence of English in terms of numbers, a sequence of numbers. Well, actually, because it's a finite sequence of numbers, and as is well known, you can code up any finite sequence of numbers itself as a number. So you can reduce this just to a single number. So, I mean, I might um, send you a code saying, uh, hey, Emiliano, um, 6,004,972. Huh, how about that? And you get your piece of paper out and you do the decoding, right? And you know what I said. All right. So what Gödel showed was this, with this sort of notion of coding was that you can express facts about um, sequ sentences, sentences or codes, have codes, sequences of sentences have codes, and therefore proofs have codes. So um, instead of talking about a proof, you could talk about its code number. Um, and because there's a kind of um, a two-way map between the code and what it codes, then anything you can express about proofs, you can express by a number. So this is how you can express things about provability simply as a fact about numbers, okay? Um, instead of saying that something is provable, you can just say, well, it's one of these numbers where all those numbers are the, the numbers of theorems. So that's how you express things about provability. Now, in Gödel's proof, you need a little bit more than that because if you're gonna code up this sentence, which says of itself that it's not provable, you need not only to be able to talk about provability, but you need some kind of reference, self-reference. So you need a sentence of the form, um, n is not provable. Remember, n is just a number, so the number of a theorem. Um, you need something of the form n is not provable, whose own code is n. Then it's effectively self referential. Um, and perhaps the most ingenious aspect of Gödel's theorem is that you can do this with a kind of fixed point construction. Um, so this has been worked out, this part of the result in particular has been worked over a great length by many later generations. And, and now we know many more things about how you turn this fixed point trick than Gödel did. Um, but showing that you could turn this fixed point trick, getting a number which had itself as its own code, uh, was really, I think, the most clever thing of Gödel's proof. Um, all right, so given that you can then find this sentence, and so intuitively it says this sentence is improvable, or it's a number, or it's a sentence of arithmetic, which says n is improvable, which has itself code n, then you can uh, try and push through the paradoxical argument. Um, and what you can show is that if the system is consistent, then you cannot prove this sentence. Or in other words, if you can prove it, the system's inconsistent. So assuming the system's consistent, you cannot prove that sentence. But because you cannot prove it, and what it's saying is true in the standard model, because you can't prove the system. So you know you, you do the decoding, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and you can see that it's true in the standard model. Um, this is itself a true sentence. So what Gödel actually showed was not simply that the set of sentences true in the standard model is not axiomatizable, well, not recursively enumerable. Um, he actually showed something which is true in the standard model and it's not recursively enumerable, which is a lot stronger. Okay. So, uh, I mean, earlier on you said, well, uh, how are you going to show this without setting the truth or otherwise of some of these examples? And you, you can do this. I mean, you might just have a very abstract proof that the set of true 
sentences in the sound of the mole is not because of new bull. That, that will be completely uh, sort of um, non-constructive proof. But Gerda achieved more than that because he showed given an axiom system, you can actually pin down one of these bloody things. And um, it doesn't look terribly interesting for mathematicians, okay? Who cares about a sentence which says it's not provable? You know, this is a party game. Um, but kind of interestingly, uh, in the 70s and 80s, mathematicians came up with some genuine mathematical, contentful mathematical issues, which can't be proved in first order arithmetic, or all these standard axiomatizations of the, a, a large fragment thereof. Um, we could go into those if you like, but. Um, yeah, well, in I fact, I was about to ask you to comment on uh, on the on the form of these girdle sentences, and if there are, of course, some some interesting sentences of this kind. So, yeah, I think uh, I think I would like to get into that. And what is the okay. The general form of, of these Gödel sentences. I mean, I, I suppose, of course, they, they must contain a universal quantifier. But um, uh, what uh, what more? I mean, uh, can we know, judging by the form, if a no. sentence is undecidable? No. Um, yeah. So um, all the sentences without quantifiers are going to be provable. All the true ones are going to be provable. So it's only when you get the quantifiers involved, you know, these sort of Hilbertian ideal elements, mm -hmm. that this situation can arise. Mm -hmm. um, is there an algorithm for telling you what can't be proved? No, because if there were, um, the set of sentences which are in the standard model would actually be decidable. Mm -hmm. um, because if not... not uh, which it can't be because it's not even recursively enumerable. So there's no no decision procedure for this. Mm -hmm. um, but the undecidable sentences are not all of this strange form. Um, so I mentioned that in the 70s and 80s, some mathematicians established some um, quite interesting problems in mathematics, uh, which um, whose truth can't be established in uh, standard axiomatizations of arithmetic, um, and it's sort of stretching, it's reaching the limits of my knowledge here. But I seem to remember that one of these is the pigeonhole principle, mm -hmm. um, which says that something like this if you've only got a finite number of pigeonholes and you've got an infinite number of pigeons, then you've got to put at least two pigeons in one pigeonhole. Okay. This is the pigeonhole principle. And, you know, you can express this in terms of numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that what some mathematicians showed, um, maybe Jeff Paris, but I, um, as I say, I'm reaching mm -hmm. the limits of my memory here, uh, was that you can't prove the pigeonhole principle mm -hmm. in say, standard axiomatizations of arithmetic. And some Diophantine uh, equation, or something to do with Diophantine equations yeah. too, if I remember well, right? Yes, that's right. Um, Something to the effect that there is no general solution to Diophantine equations or something like that? Yeah, uh, so this is um, a very famous problem um, enunciated by Hilbert in the year 1900. Um, so it's called Hilbert's 10th problem. If you've got a Diophantine equation, which just means a polynomial equation with integer coefficients, like, you know, 5x cubed plus 3x squared plus x plus 2 equals 0. Mm -hmm. Um, and integer solutions too. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, can you always solve equations of that form? Yeah. Um, mm. you, you cannot. Um, and you can prove that you cannot. You can. That was a famous unsolved problem. Mm -hmm. um, but it was proved when in this, uh, th that result was proved in the 70s, I think, maybe late 60s, mm -hmm. by Maciasiewicz, building on the work of a number of other logicians. Um, but he's usually credited with this result. 
Hermann Weil said that uh, Gödel's result was draining his enthusiasm for, for his research in mathematics because he could no longer know whether uh, the problem he was working was of a Gödel kind or not. And, um, but but uh, going back to the, to the um, form of, of, uh, of Gödel's sentences, so let, let's call Gödel's sentences all the uh, many, infinitely many sentences that you can build uh, in a various um, uh, different codings that you can come up with uh, is uh, undecidability coextensive with the uh, Gödel sentences? I mean, and, uh, uh, suppose that you know uh, that a sentence uh, in arithmetic is undecidable. Do you thereby come to know that there is a Gödel number or some kind of coding which uh, Produces uh, that undecidability, or can, or are there other ways in well, which non gödelian ways in which a, a, a sentence could be undecidable? Sure. Look, I mean, it's, a, a, any sentence is going to have a code because you can cut up every sentence. Yeah. Um, so every unprovable sentence is going to have a code. Every provable sentence is going to have a code. Um, but that doesn't mean that every undecidable sentence is going to look like a girdle sentence in that it applies self-reference. So, you know, this pigeonhole principle, mm. um, if I've got it right, and that's unprovable in, say, piano arithmetic, a standard axiomatization arithmetic, um, that doesn't look anything like a girdle sentence. Um, actually, you know, once you get to set theory matters become much more complex and interesting because set theory is incomplete as well it contains arithmetic mm -hmm. so you know it's going to be incomplete but it's going to have more interesting inconsistent more interesting incompletenesses than just arithmetic mm -hmm. and there are many famous problems of set theory which are insoluble in standard set theory so once, once you move, i'd like to continue my hypothesis so once you move from arithmetic to set theory, things become much more complex, but in some sense more interesting. 